Welcome to Ace My Exams Learning. Let us get started with today's learning. Question. Define the word internet. The internet is a global network that facilitates the connection of computer terminals, computers, mobile devices, and computer networks to any other computer anywhere in the world via Reuters and servers. This interconnectedness enables seamless communication and data exchange between computers and computer networks regardless of geographic location. Question. Explain five requirements of getting access to use online banking when requesting balances, bank statements, transferring money, etc. Below are five requirements for a user to access online banking. 1. Activation by bank official. Online banking access necessitates activation by a bank official, typically requiring a client to visit their bank to initiate the process. This ensures the security and legitimacy of the online banking account. 2. Bank account number and password. Users must input their bank account number to gain initial access to online banking. Subsequently, they are prompted to create a password, serving as a secure authentication measure for logging into their account. 3. Password confirmation. For added security, users are required to repeat their chosen password during the setup process. This step helps verify the accuracy of the password entry and reduces the risk of unauthorized access. 4. Access to banking services. Upon successful login, users gain access to a range of banking services through the online platform. This includes functionalities such as checking balances, requesting bank statements, and initiating fund transfers. 5. Transaction capabilities. Once logged into the banking website, users can perform various financial transactions conveniently over the internet. This may include transferring money between accounts, paying bills, setting up recurring payments, and managing investment portfolios, among other banking activities. Question. When stock must be issued, a responsible person should be assigned for the task. Name five guidelines that a responsible person should keep in mind and follow when issuing office stock. Below are the five guidelines that a responsible person should keep in mind and follow when issuing office stock. 1. Decision-making authority. A specific person should be held responsible for issuing stock and have the authority to make informed decisions regarding the type and quantity of supplies to be issued, considering factors such as demand, usage patterns, and budget constraints. 2. Reliability and knowledge. It's essential for the person in control of issuing stock to be highly reliable and possess a thorough understanding of stock management procedures. This includes knowledge of inventory control practices, storage requirements, and methods for issuing and tracking stock. 3. Supervision and regular checks. Strict supervision is necessary to ensure proper stock management. The responsible person should regularly check stock cards to monitor inventory levels and promptly identify shortages to ensure timely stock ordering to meet operational needs. 4. Record keeping. Accurate records must be maintained for all stock issued, documenting what items were distributed and to whom. This documentation serves as a crucial accountability measure and helps track usage patterns over time. 5. Maintain optimal stock levels. The responsible person should strive to keep stock levels low while ensuring that adequate supplies are available to meet operational requirements. This involves balancing the need to minimize storage costs with the need to prevent stockouts and disruptions to workflow. 6. Official requisitions. The stock should only be issued against official requisitions or requests from authorized personnel. This helps prevent unauthorized access to stock and ensures that resources are allocated efficiently based on identified needs. 7. Up-to-date stock control. Stock control cards must always be updated to reflect accurate inventory levels. Additionally, Regular stock taking should be conducted to reconcile physical stock counts with recorded inventory data and identify any discrepancies for investigation or correction. Question. 
You are employed as a secretary in the communication section of a business. You share an office with other secretaries of other sections to make sure that the objectives of the organization are achieved. The telephone system of the business has several functions. Two of the functions are the diversion of calls and the restriction of destinations. Name five other functions than those already mentioned. Five other functions of the telephone system besides call diversion and destination restriction are 1. Voicemail Allowing callers to leave recorded messages when the recipient is unavailable or on another call. 2. Call forwarding Redirecting incoming calls to another phone number or extension. 3. Caller ID Displaying the phone number and or name of the incoming caller on the recipient's phone screen. 4. Call waiting. Alerting users of incoming calls while they are already engaged in a conversation, thus allowing them to switch between calls. 5. Intercom. Enabling internal communication between different extensions or departments using the phone system without the need for external calls. Question. When a fire breaks out and the fire alarm goes off, what actions will you take to handle this emergency? In the event of a fire emergency, here's how I would handle the situation. 1. Immediately inform the authorities. As soon as the fire alarm goes off, I would inform both the fire brigade and the security section, providing them with all relevant details such as the location and severity of the fire. 2. Close windows and doors. To prevent the spread of fire, I would swiftly close all windows and doors in the vicinity. 3. Assess the situation. I would assess the location and magnitude of the fire to determine the best course of action and to ensure everyone's safety. 4. Utilize fire extinguishers. While awaiting the arrival of the fire brigade, I would attempt to extinguish the fire using appropriate fire extinguishers, following safety protocols and considering the size and type of fire. 5. Evacuate and aid the injured. If there are injured individuals, I would promptly move them to a safe location away from the fire and provide any necessary first aid while awaiting medical assistance. 6. Keep others informed. Throughout the emergency, I would keep everyone in the vicinity informed about the situation, ensuring that they understand what is happening and what actions they should take to ensure their safety. Question. State five things that a management assistant must pay attention to regarding his, her own professional image to contribute to an effective and successful working climate. One, attitude. Maintain a positive attitude that attracts people and fosters good relations, demonstrating the willingness to go above and beyond what is expected in tasks and interactions. 2. Image of the MA. Professionally present oneself by being well-dressed and well-groomed, which not only reflects self-respect, but also shows respect for others, leaving a lasting impression in the workplace. 3. Body language. Pay attention to facial expressions, posture, and demeanor, ensuring an open, inviting stance that signals approachability and willingness to assist, as opposed to closed-off or non-approving body language, which can hinder effective communication. 4. Communication. Possess fluent language skills, speak audibly and clearly, and maintain a friendly and sensitive tone while avoiding the use of foul language. Effective communication is crucial for fostering a positive working climate and ensuring tasks are carried out efficiently. 5. Relating to others. Show respect towards managers and colleagues, refrain from engaging in gossip, or discussing others in a negative light, and prioritize honesty in all interactions. Building trust and maintaining professional relationships contribute significantly to a successful working environment. Question. Name various types of diaries that are available for people to manage their time effectively. Each diary type below serves specific needs or preferences and provides options for individuals to effectively manage their time and schedules according to their lifestyle and profession. 1. Diaries designed for executive officers or managers. Executive diaries are tailored to meet the demands of managers and officers. 
They include sections for daily schedules, meeting agendas, priority tasks, and long-term planning. They are available in various sizes and incorporate specialized features like goal setting and performance tracking tools. They are designed to enhance effective time management and informed decision making. 2. Different sizes, A3, A4, or calendars. Diaries come in varying sizes to suit different needs. A3 diaries offer ample space for detailed planning, suitable for executives. A4 diaries are sizable and portable, making them popular among professionals. Calendar style diaries provide a broader view of appointments, facilitating long term planning. 3. Diaries for different professions. Profession specific diaries meet the unique needs of various occupations. For example, healthcare professionals benefit from diaries with sections for patient appointments, medical notes, and treatment plans. Teachers use diaries with lesson planning templates, grading trackers, and academic calendars to manage their teaching responsibilities. 4. Electronic diaries using computer software. Electronic diaries offer advanced functionality and seamless integration with digital tools. They are accessible on various devices and often include automatic reminders, synchronization, and cloud storage. Examples include Google Calendar, Microsoft Outlook, and Evernote. These tools help users stay organized, manage their time efficiently, and optimize their productivity. 5. Pocket-sized diaries. Pocket-sized diaries are compact, portable, and perfect for people on the go. They fit in pockets, purses, or bags, providing easy access and enough space for daily schedules, to-do lists, and important notes. Professionals like sales representatives, consultants, and technicians prefer them for on-the-go organization. Question. Name five methods in which information is circulated and distributed to all departments daily. Each of the following methods plays a crucial role in connecting departments and ensuring that vital information is circulated efficiently among departments. 1. Face-to-face -face communication. When it comes to direct and personal communication, face-to-face -face communication is a highly effective method that can be used to circulate information among departments daily. This method facilitates immediate feedback and clarification of any queries or concerns. 2. Hard copy communication. Hard copy communication, such as memos, reports, or circulars, is an excellent way to ensure that vital information is disseminated effectively to all departments, especially for those who may not have immediate access to electronic devices or networks. This method allows everyone to receive the information, regardless of technological limitations. 3. Electronic communication platforms. Electronic communication platforms, including emails, internal messaging systems, and digital bulletin boards, offer a swift and efficient means of distributing information across departments. They enable quick dissemination and documentation of important updates or announcements to ensure everyone in the department is on the same page and has access to the information they need. 4. Telecommunication. Telecommunication, either by phone calls, conference calls, or video conferencing, enables real-time communication and collaboration among departments. This is particularly useful for discussing urgent matters or coordinating tasks that require immediate attention. This method helps to ensure that everyone is up to date on the latest developments and can collaborate seamlessly. 5. Instant Messaging Message services like instant messaging applications or SMS provide a convenient channel for exchanging brief updates, reminders, or notifications among departments. This helps to foster communication and enhance workflow efficiency throughout the organization. This method is useful for quick updates or reminders to be sent out promptly. Question. Explain the techniques that a management assistant would use when receiving and dealing with the following types of visitors. As a management assistant, one of your key responsibilities is to receive and interact with visitors. However, each type of visitor requires a different approach and set of skills to manage effectively, as explained below. 
1. Talkative Visitor In case of a talkative visitor, please request them to complete the visitor's form if it is their first visit. This will ensure proper documentation. It is advisable to avoid making excessive eye contact, so you can send a subtle message to the visitor that they need to focus or move on. 2. Visitor without an appointment In case of a visitor without an appointment, start by politely asking for their name or business card if available, this will enable you to obtain their contact information. After that, ask about the purpose of their visit or the person they intended to see. If the individual they intended to meet with is unavailable, offer your assistance or suggest another appropriate contact who can assist them. 3. Inquisitive Visitor For a curious visitor, it's important to keep your documents neatly organized in files and ensure they are closed when not in use to maintain confidentiality. Be assertive and maintain control over the conversation by adopting a firm and assertive manner of speaking. When faced with provocative statements, it's best to be cautious with your responses and refrain from making comments that could potentially escalate tensions or create conflict. 4. Family and friends waiting to see the manager. When family or friends visit the manager, offer them a seat and create a comfortable environment. It's important to promptly inform the manager of their arrival while maintaining a professional and welcoming demeanor. This will uphold the organization's image and also help build positive relationships. Remember to treat them with warmth and respect to make them feel valued. Question. Serving of liquor should be done correctly. State five aspects a management assistant should take note of when serving liquor. Below are the five key aspects a management assistant should observe when serving liquor. 1. Using a corkscrew. A management assistant should ensure that wine bottles are opened correctly using a corkscrew to prevent any contamination of the wine and maintain its integrity. 2. Portion control for fortified wines. Fortified wines typically have a higher alcohol content, so a management assistant must serve them in smaller glasses to control the amount of alcohol patrons consume. 3. Portion control for brandy and whiskey. Given that brandy and whiskey contain the highest levels of alcohol, therefore a management assistant must exercise caution and pour only a small amount into each glass to adhere to responsible serving practices. 4. Selection of appropriate glassware. Different types of glasses are designed to enhance the drinking experience for various liquors. A management assistant must use the correct combination of glassware to ensure patrons receive the intended sensory experience from their chosen liquor. 5. Temperature and serving method for white wine. White wine should always be served cold to optimize its flavor profile. Additionally, it can be served with ice if desired. A management assistant should pay attention to these details to ensure patrons enjoy their white wine at its best. Question. Name five general questions that a management assistant should ask when goods have to be purchased for office use. One of the important roles of a management assistant is to supervise the procurement process by posing the following questions that cover different aspects of the procurement process. 1. Who is responsible or has the authority to purchase office supplies? 2. Where, when, how much and what must be purchased? 3. What about price, quality, guarantees, deliveries, rebate and after-sales service? 4. Is the purchasing process centralized or decentralized across different departments? 5. What are the preferred payment methods for procurement, cash, check, or credit card? Question. When buying office equipment for reproduction, printing or copying, the most suitable equipment is needed. Name five factors to be considered before buying office equipment or printing equipment. When purchasing office equipment, it's important to consider the following factors before making a purchase. 1. Cost. Consider the initial investment required for purchasing the equipment and the long-term operational costs including maintenance, supplies such as ink or toner, and energy consumption. Opting for cost-effective solutions that align with your budget is crucial to ensure financial sustainability. 2. Color Capability 
consider whether you need your equipment to produce color or monochrome documents. If you work in an office that requires vivid and detailed color reproductions, it may be necessary to invest in color-capable equipment. On the other hand, if most of your documents are primarily black and white, opting for a monochrome printer or copier could be a more cost-effective choice. 3. Paper Handling Make sure to assess the paper types and sizes that the equipment can accommodate. Check if it can handle the commonly used paper sizes in your office, such as letter, legal, or tabloid, along with speciality papers like envelopes or cardstock. You should also consider the equipment's paper capacity and whether it fulfills the printing demands of your office without the need for frequent reloading. 4. Time Efficiency Assess the speed and efficiency of the equipment in completing printing or copying tasks. Time is a valuable resource in any office environment, so selecting equipment that can quickly produce high-quality outputs can enhance productivity and streamline workflow processes. Consider factors such as warm-up time, printing speed, and automatic document feeders for copying large volumes efficiently. 5. Reliability and Maintenance Evaluate the reliability and durability of the equipment to minimize downtime and maintenance requirements. Choose reputable brands known for their reliability and quality craftsmanship. Additionally, consider the availability of technical support, warranties, and maintenance services to ensure prompt resolution of any issues that may arise during the equipment's lifespan. Prioritizing reliability can help prevent disruptions to daily operations and ensure consistent performance over time. Question. Explain the following terms with regard to meetings. 1. Congress. A Congress is a formal gathering where delegates from various branches or offices of the same organization come together. It involves representatives who discuss and deliberate on organizational matters and often feature speeches, presentations, debates, and decision-making processes to address key issues and formulate strategies or policies. 2. Meeting in camera. A meeting in camera is a session conducted behind closed doors, where only invited participants are allowed to attend. This type of meeting is confidential and discussions are intended to be private and sensitive. Such a meeting may discuss confidential legal, personnel, or strategic planning matters. 3. Seminar. A seminar is a short study course focused on a specific problem or topic, led by one or two experts in the field. Unlike larger conferences or congresses, seminars tend to be more interactive and participatory, with attendees having the opportunity to engage in discussions, ask questions, and share their perspectives. 4. Symposium. It is a study group which investigates a specific matter or problem. Though it is similar to a seminar, it has a larger and more diverse group of participants. The symposium often includes various activities such as presentations, panel discussions, workshops, and collaborative sessions. To explore different aspects of the topic and create innovative solutions or recommendations. 5. Constitution. A constitution is a foundational document that outlines the organization's rules and principles and establishes its structure, objectives, rights, responsibilities, and procedures. It defines the powers and functions of the governing body, committees, decision-making mechanisms, dispute resolution procedures, and amendment processes. Question. Architects use the tubular filing system to store their big documents, for example, home plans. Explain how this system works. Architects use a specialized filing system to store large documents, such as home plans. This system is called the tubular filing system. It involves rolling the documents and placing them inside tubes made from cardboard, metal, or plastic. These tubes are not only perfect for organizing the documents, but also provide a layer of protection ensuring that the documents are not damaged or misplaced. Lids are affixed to both ends of the tubes and labeled with the file name for easy identification. This labeling system streamlines the retrieval process, 
ensuring architects can quickly locate the specific document they need. To make the most of available storage space, tubes are often stacked or arranged side by side on shelves. This method of stacking allows easy access to multiple documents while also maximizing the use of space. For architects looking for enhanced mobility and organization, there are tubular roll file trollers available. These trollers are specially designed to accommodate drawing, map, and plan tubes. They offer a convenient solution for transportation and storage, making it easier for architects to manage their large document collections. For companies dealing with large building plans that don't fit into conventional folders, the tubular filing system can be a game changer. It's an effective way to maintain the integrity and accessibility of architectural documents, which is crucial for smooth project workflows and collaborations. By adopting this method, such companies can ensure that their plans are well organized and easy to locate, which saves time and effort. Question. Name five items of stationery and equipment that the secretary must have ready for meetings. The secretary must ensure the following stationary items and equipment are ready for meetings. 1. Pens and paper. These two are essential for note-taking and jotting down important points during the meeting. 2. Overhead projector. The overhead projector is useful for displaying visual aids or slides to complement presentations. 3. Writing board. The writing board provides a surface for illustrating concepts or jotting down key points during discussions. 4. Flip chart. The flip chart is a versatile platform for presenting information, brainstorming, or recording ideas during the meeting. 5. Slides, computer-generated visual presentations or videos. Visual aids like slides, computer-generated visual presentations, and videos can enhance presentations and convey information more effectively. 6. Communication media. This equipment is used for teleconferencing, video conferencing, or online presentations to facilitate remote participation. 7. Duplicating facilities. Duplicating facilities are necessary for making copies of documents, handouts, or materials distributed during the meeting. 8. Recording equipment. Recording equipment is used to document meeting proceedings accurately, which helps when preparing minutes or reviewing discussions. 9. Microphone. Finally, a microphone enhances audio clarity and ensures that all participants can hear each other clearly, particularly in larger meeting rooms or during remote sessions. Question. Briefly explain any five duties or responsibilities that will form part of the junior secretary's job description. The junior secretary undertakes the following duties and responsibilities as part of their job description. 1. Managing communication channels. The junior secretary handles telephone calls, telex, and fax transmissions to ensure prompt responses and efficient communication with clients, suppliers, and other stakeholders. 2. Filing management. Organizes and maintains physical and digital filing systems to ensure easy retrieval and secure storage of documents, correspondence, and records. 3. Client negotiations. Assists in negotiations with clients, suppliers, or partners to ensure smooth communication and collaboration to meet business objectives. 4. Meeting planning. Coordinating and planning meetings, including scheduling, preparing agendas, arranging venues, and ensuring all necessary resources are available for successful meetings. 5. Office Operations Control. Manages stationery and office equipment inventory to ensure adequate supplies are maintained and liaises with vendors for efficient procurement and maintenance. Additionally, the junior secretary oversees general office operations to ensure smooth functioning. 6. Diary and Travel Management. He or she manages the employer's diary by scheduling appointments and coordinating travel arrangements including booking flights, hotels, and transportation. This contributes to the overall efficiency of the business or organization. When promoted to a senior position, third level, a secretary 
has to apply organizational and project management skills. State six functions of a senior secretary other than the skills mentioned above. In addition to the mentioned skills, the senior secretary should also be able to 1. Utilize advanced computer proficiency, including specialized programs and electronic aids, to streamline administrative tasks and enhance productivity. 2. Demonstrate the ability to work autonomously with minimal supervision, taking initiative, and making decisions independently when necessary to ensure smooth workflow and timely task completion. 3. Exhibit fluency in more than one language, with excellent communication skills, to enable effective interaction with diverse stakeholders domestically and internationally, thereby fostering stronger connections and facilitating smoother collaborations. 4. Effectively manage daily routine tasks such as paperwork, correspondence, and administrative duties, ensuring meticulous attention to detail and accuracy to maintain organizational efficiency and compliance. 5. Oversee the planning and organization of travel arrangements, including intricate logistics and scheduling, to ensure seamless execution and meet the organization's needs. 6. Proficiently draft excerpts and summaries of reports, including complex information into concise and understandable formats, to facilitate decision-making processes and provide valuable insights to stakeholders. Question. Which aspects are to be taken into account when compiling a business card? Name five of these aspects to be considered. The following aspects should be considered when designing a business card. 1. Clarity of information. Ensure that only essential information is included on the business card, such as the organization's name, individual's name, position, telephone and fax numbers, and street address. Avoid cluttering the card with unnecessary details. 2. Design consistency. Maintain a simple design scheme with either black or white printing, reserving color only for the organization's logo. Consistency in design helps in creating a professional and cohesive appearance. 3. Omission of photographs. Adhere to the guideline of not including any photographs on the business card. This maintains a clean and professional look, focusing solely on textual information. 4. No abbreviations. Avoid using abbreviations in the information presented on the business card. Full names of the organization, individual, positions, and address should be spelled out to ensure clarity and professionalism. 5. Space utilization. The business card layout should optimally utilize space to allow easy reading and understanding of the provided information. Proper spacing and alignment contribute to a visually appealing and functional design. Question. A formal motion can postpone, end or even prevent the discussion of an item. Is this true or false? Substantiate your answer by stating five characteristics of a formal motion. The answer is true and here are the characteristics of a formal motion that substantiate this answer. 1. A motion must be proposed and seconded. This indicates that a motion has to be formally introduced and supported by at least one other member, which demonstrates initial agreement and seriousness. 2. A motion must be clearly understood and unambiguous. Clarity ensures that the motion's intent is unmistakable reducing the likelihood of confusion or misinterpretation during discussion. 3. It must fall within the scope of the constitution of the organization. This ensures that motions align with the organization's purpose, goals, and rules, maintaining coherence and legitimacy in decision-making. 4. It must refer to one matter only. This characteristic ensures that motions address specific issues or proposals, preventing confusion, or dilution of focus during discussion. 5. A motion appearing on the agenda may not be withdrawn without the permission of the chairperson, proposer, and seconder. This implies that once a motion is on the agenda, it can influence the course of discussion and decision-making, potentially leading to the postponement, end, or prevention of the discussion of other items. 6. A motion that is defeated may not be proposed again at the same meeting, this characteristic suggests that if a motion fails to garner support, it cannot be reintroduced during the same meeting, 
potentially preventing further discussion on the matter. 7. Emotion normally begins with the word that. This linguistic convention indicates the formal initiation of a proposal for consideration, signaling the start of discussion and decision-making. 8. A formal motion may not be amended. This implies that once a motion is proposed, it remains intact without alteration, potentially limiting the flexibility of discussion, but ensuring clarity and consistency in decision-making. 9. Once a formal motion has been accepted, it receives preference above any other matter. This characteristic indicates that accepted motions take priority over other agenda items, potentially leading to the postponement, end or prevention of the discussion of other matters if time or attention is limited. 10. Only members who have not participated in a discussion of the matter may submit such a motion. This characteristic suggests that motions are open to all members, but only those who haven't already engaged in the discussion of a particular matter can propose them, potentially influencing the timing and dynamics of discussion and decision-making. Name five procedures when an amendment is made by members during a meeting. Below are the five procedures members should follow when making an amendment. 1. Proposal of amendment. A member proposes a specific amendment to the motion on the floor. This proposal should be clear, concise, and relevant to the original motion. The member should clearly state the proposed changes and the reasons behind them. 2. Seconding of amendment. Another member of the meeting seconds the proposed amendment, indicating that there is adequate support for discussing the proposed changes. This ensures that the proposed amendment receives due consideration and is not dismissed without discussion. 3. Discussion of amendment. The chairperson ensures that only one amendment is discussed at a time. Members can discuss the proposed amendment, providing reasons for or against it. Each member is allowed to speak on the proposed amendment once, ensuring that everyone has a chance to voice their opinions. 4. Written submission. It is preferable, though not mandatory, for the proposed amendment to be in writing. The proposer and seconder should ideally draft the proposed changes, sign the document, and hand it to the chairperson for reference and clarity. This written submission helps avoid misunderstandings and ensures that everyone is clear about the proposed changes. 5. Voting on amendment. After discussion, the chairperson calls for a vote on the proposed amendment. Members must be reminded that the original motion has not been accepted yet. Each member casts their vote either in favor or against the proposed amendment. If the amendment passes, it becomes part of the motion. If it fails, the assembly continues to consider the original motion without the proposed changes. Question. A point of order may be raised in certain circumstances in a meeting. Briefly explain these circumstances. A point of order may be raised in a meeting under the following circumstances. 1. Offensive and insulting language. If a member uses offensive and insulting language during the proceedings. For instance, during a debate about a contentious issue, a member uses derogatory language towards another member, causing offence and disrupting the decorum of the meeting. Another member can raise a point of order to address this behaviour. 2. Quorum not met. When a meeting no longer constitutes a quorum, and the chairman is unaware of this fact. For example in a board meeting, several members leave, unknowingly bringing the total number of attendees below the required quorum. If the chairman continues with the meeting without realizing the lack of quorum, a member can raise a point of order to halt proceedings until the quorum is re-established. 3. Contrary to law. If a motion or amendment proposed in the meeting is contrary to the law of the country. In case of a local council meeting, a member proposes a motion to implement a policy that directly contradicts a relevant national or local law. Another member can raise a point of order to highlight the legal inconsistency and prevent the motion from proceeding. 4. Lack of seconding. When a motion has not been seconded before the meeting and the chairman fails to consider this. For instance, during a homeowners association meeting, a member proposes a motion to allocate funds for a community event, but no other member seconds the motion. 
If the chairman overlooks this requirement and proceeds with discussion or voting, a member can raise a point of order to remind the chair of the procedural error. 5. Irregularities in proceedings. If there have been irregularities in the proceedings of the meeting. For example, in a student council meeting, the chairperson skips over an item on the agenda without proper discussion or vote. If a member notices this deviation from the established procedures, they can raise a point of order to ensure that all agenda items are addressed according to the rules of order. Question. As soon as a meeting is over, indicate your five duties as a management assistant. After the meeting, as a management assistant, your duties include 1. Tidying the room. Ensure that the meeting room is tidied up, including arranging chairs, clearing away any materials, and generally leaving the space in an orderly condition. 2. Gathering and filing documents. Collect all documents used during the meeting, such as agendas, minutes, presentations, and reports, and file them appropriately for future reference or distribution. 3. Returning forgotten documents. Identify any documents that were left behind by members and ensure they are returned to their respective owners promptly. This may involve contacting members or arranging for delivery of the documents. 4. Returning apparatus. Gather any apparatus or equipment used during the meeting, such as projectors, microphones, or laptops, and ensure they are returned to their proper storage or designated locations. 5. Ensuring no personal articles remain. Check the meeting room for any personal belongings left behind by attendees. If any items are found, make arrangements to return them to their owners promptly and securely. Question. Name five different methods of voting that can be used at a meeting. The voting methods below offer various ways for members at a meeting to make decisions or express preferences. Here are five different methods of voting. 1. Acclamation. This method requires members at a meeting to verbally express their agreement or support for a candidate or proposal. It typically involves a loud verbal affirmation or applause. 2. Show of hands. In this method, members at a meeting physically raise their hands to indicate their support or opposition to a candidate or proposal. It's a simple and straightforward way to gauge the majority opinion. 3. Ballot, secret voting. This method ensures confidentiality by allowing voters to cast their votes anonymously. Each voter marks their choice on a ballot paper, which is then collected and counted privately, maintaining the secrecy of individual preferences. 4. Division. Division involves physically separating members into groups based on their vote. For example, if there's a proposal, members may be asked to stand on different sides of the room to signify their support or opposition. This method provides a clear visual representation of the division within the members. 5. Voting by proxy. In this method, a member delegates their voting rights to another person, known as a proxy. The proxy then casts the vote on behalf of the absent voter according to their instructions or their best judgment. It allows individuals who cannot be present to participate in voting. Question. Explain the legal requirements for a meeting. Legal requirements for conducting a meeting are governed by a combination of requirements, as explained below. 1. Acts or statutes of the country. In many jurisdictions, specific laws regulate how meetings are to be conducted and who may attend them. These statutes outline procedural requirements, such as notice periods, quorum thresholds, and voting procedures. For instance, a country's company law may mandate that a company must provide shareholders with notice of the meeting at least 30 days in advance. Additionally, the law can stipulate that certain decisions, such as amendments to the Articles of Incorporation or the election of directors, require a two-thirds majority vote from shareholders present at the meeting. 2. Constitution of the Organization the Constitution serves as the fundamental document that outlines the rules and procedures governing the organization's operations, including meetings. For example, 
The constitution of a non-profit organization may specify that board meetings must be held quarterly and that a quorum, consisting of at least two-thirds of the board members, must be present to conduct official business. Furthermore, the constitution may outline the roles of the chairperson and secretary during meetings and how decisions can be made and recorded. 3. Common law. Common law principles, derived from judicial decisions and legal precedents, may also influence meeting requirements. These principles reflect notions of fairness, equity, and justice and may be applied by courts to resolve disputes arising from meeting procedures. For example, if a homeowner alleges that the homeowners association unfairly restricted their right to speak during the meeting, the court may consider past legal precedents and standards of procedural fairness in determining whether the association violated the homeowner's rights. 4. Tradition. Meeting practices within an organization are often influenced by its traditions, which may not be formally outlined in the constitution or statutes. Such customs and norms, developed over time, can shape various aspects of meeting conduct. For instance, during a university faculty meeting, it may be customary for the dean to start the session with a brief reflection on the institution's mission and values. Although not necessarily mandated by the university's bylaws or policies, this tradition has become an established practice over time, fostering a sense of shared purpose among the faculty members. 5. Customs and Habits Organizations often develop their customs and habits regarding meeting conduct, which may vary depending on organizational culture, industry norms, or member preferences. In a tech startup, it's typical to commence team meetings with a quick, stand-up session where each team member gives a concise rundown on their current tasks and any challenges they might be facing. Although the company's policies may not explicitly require this practice, it has become a habitual way to keep everyone informed and maintain accountability within the team. Question. You are employed as a management assistant in the communication section of the Department of Health at a local municipality. You share an open plan office with a senior secretary. Describe your daily duties. As a management assistant in the communication section of the Department of Health in a local municipality, my daily duties will be as follows. 1. Receiving visitors. I will be responsible for greeting and assisting office visitors by providing a welcoming and professional environment. 2. Answering service management. I will control and manage the officer's answering service, ensuring that all calls are handled promptly and efficiently. 3. Meeting coordination. I will also be responsible for booking and organizing meetings, managing schedules, and ensuring meeting rooms are prepared. 4. Text message communication. I will facilitate quick and effective communication by using computer systems to send and receive text messages. 5. Petty cash management. Handling petty cash transactions, maintaining accurate records, and ensuring adherence to financial protocols. 6. Office equipment oversight. Taking responsibility for office equipment, including computers, printers, and other devices. While also arranging for their maintenance and the availability of necessary supplies. 7. Filing and typing. Conducting small-scale filing tasks to organize documents efficiently and assisting with typing duties as needed to support administrative tasks. Question. A company can get a competitive advantage from its image. Discuss any five factors that influence the corporate image of the company. Several factors contribute to shaping and influencing the corporate image of a company. They are. 1. Impression of products, services, and sales staff. The customer's perception of a company's products, services, and sales staff directly shapes its corporate image. Positive impressions in these areas contribute to a favorable overall image, fostering customer satisfaction and loyalty. 2. Competitors' perception. The consumer's viewpoint of competitors' products, services, and sales staff directly influences how they perceive the company itself. If a company is seen favorably in comparison to its competitors, 
it gains a positive image by association. On the other hand, if consumers believe that competitors offer superior products or services, it may negatively impact the company's image. 3. Size of the enterprise. The size of a company plays a pivotal role in shaping its image. Large enterprises may benefit from better advertising capabilities, leading to increased visibility. On the other hand, small businesses can leverage a more personalized service approach, creating a distinct image based on customer relationships. 4. Staff Behavior and Sales Team The behavior and professionalism of staff, especially frontline personnel, have a profound impact on corporate image. Positive interactions, courteous service, and knowledgeable sales staff contribute to building a favorable perception among the public and consumers. 5. Trust and faith in products. The level of trust and faith that consumers have in a company's products is a critical factor influencing its corporate image. Building a reputation for reliable and high-quality products enhances consumer confidence, positively contributing to the overall image of the company. 6. Appearance of the building and grounds. The physical appearance of the company's infrastructure, including buildings and grounds, contributes to the corporate image. Factors such as layout, tidiness, choice of furniture, and interior decorations all play a role in creating a visually appealing and professional environment. 7. Public opinion based on belief and information. Public opinion is shaped by belief and information. Recognizing that each person in the company, dealing with the public has the power to influence public opinion, can result in the collective responsibility of the workforce to build a positive corporate image to benefit the company. Question. List factors that may influence the remuneration package of the management assistant. The management assistant's remuneration package is influenced by the following factors. 1. Size of the organization. The scale and financial capacity of the organization play a significant role in determining the remuneration package for a management assistant. Unlike smaller firms, larger organizations with greater resources may offer specialized work with competitive salary and benefit packages. 2. Urban versus rural location. The organization's location, whether urban or rural, influences the management assistant's remuneration. Urban firms often have higher turnovers and pay more than their rural counterparts. Additionally, the cost or standard of living in rural versus urban areas may impact salary structures, as companies strive to attract and retain talent. 3. Job description or type of work. Senior positions with specialized job responsibilities generally come with better compensation than junior or less experienced positions. 4. Professional associations and codes of conduct. Professional associations and codes of conduct play a crucial role in setting standards for remuneration within the industry. By adhering to these standards, organizations can ensure fairness and consistency in compensation structures for management assistants. 5. Experience, knowledge, and skills. When it comes to determining salaries and remuneration packages, experience, knowledge, and skills are key factors to consider. Individuals who possess more experience, skills, and knowledge are likely to earn higher salaries or receive better remuneration packages. Question. List five ways through which a management assistant may show professionalism in their work. A management assistant needs to display elements of professionalism to not only fulfill their administrative responsibilities, but also contribute positively to the workplace culture and the success of the organization, as outlined below. 1. Image portrayal. Maintaining a professional appearance and demeanor is crucial for management assistants. They should dress appropriately and present themselves in a polished manner to reflect a commitment to professionalism. 2. Attitude displayed. The management assistant should always maintain a positive and proactive attitude and approach tasks with enthusiasm, adaptability, and a solution-oriented mindset to demonstrate his or her dedication to the role and organization. 3. Good conduct. 
the management assistant should uphold ethical standards and demonstrate integrity in all actions. Professionalism is evident when the management assistant adheres to ethical guidelines, demonstrating honesty, trustworthiness, accountability, and overall contribution to good conduct. 4. Verbal and Nonverbal Communication The management assistant should effectively communicate, both verbal and nonverbal, using clear and concise verbal communication, coupled with positive body language and active listening, to foster a professional and conducive work environment. 5. Interaction and good relationship with others. He or she should build positive relationships with colleagues, superiors, and clients to promote collaboration, teamwork, and respectful interactions. This enables the management assistant to contribute to a harmonious workplace, while also showcasing the assistant's ability to work well with others. Question. Explain how you as a management assistant may handle beggars who come to seek arms on the company premises. As a management assistant, handling beggars on company premises involves a compassionate yet firm approach. The following steps can be taken. 1. Do not entertain their begging or needs. It is essential not to engage in or encourage begging on the company premises. The management assistant should acknowledge the person's presence but must avoid providing direct assistance to discourage the behavior. 2. Follow company policy. The management assistant should adhere to the company's policies regarding interactions with individuals on the premises. Companies often have guidelines in place for addressing solicitation or panhandling, and it's important to align actions with these policies. 3. Appropriate timing and direct communication. If the timing is inappropriate, such as during work hours or in restricted areas, the management assistant should maintain eye contact and address the person in a humane and friendly manner to communicate that, due to company policy or other considerations, you cannot provide any contribution at that moment. Question. A management assistant can also be employed as an administrative assistant. Explain the duties that will be expected from this position. The roles of a management assistant and an administrative assistant are often seen as similar and the terms are sometimes used interchangeably. Here are some key duties performed by an administrative assistant. 1. Managing telephonic communication. The administrative assistant handles and coordinates telephonic communication to ensure efficient and professional communication with internal and external parties. This involves answering calls, taking messages, and directing calls to the appropriate personnel. 2. Dealing with clients, consumers, and visitors. He or she interacts with different types of clients, consumers, and visitors professionally and courteously by addressing inquiries, providing information, and ensuring a customer-friendly experience. 3. Fulfilling managerial duties. The management assistant fulfills various managerial duties as assigned. This may involve supporting higher-level managers in tasks such as project coordination, team collaboration, and strategic planning. 4. Utilizing information and resources. He or she is also tasked with utilizing information and other resources to enhance productivity. This includes using office software, databases, and other tools to manage tasks, retrieve information, and contribute to the overall effectiveness of the administrative processes. 5. Managing reception. This involves overseeing the reception area and greeting visitors, clients, and employees by maintaining a welcoming and organized reception space and providing information and assistance as needed. 6. Managing records, budgets, and stock. The administrative assistant also maintains and organizes records, including documents, files, and data. In addition, he or she assists in budget management, tracking expenses, and managing stock or inventory to ensure optimal resource utilization. 7. Managing meetings and gatherings. Lastly, he or she coordinates all aspects related to meetings, both internal and external. This includes scheduling, preparing agendas, arranging logistics, and ensuring that meetings run smoothly. Question. 
Your sense of duty towards your manager is one of the key aspects of the duties of a professional management assistant. How will you fulfill this responsibility? As a professional management assistant, my sense of duty towards my manager is paramount, and I will fulfill this responsibility in the following ways. 1. Giving full and immediate attention. Priority shall be given to the manager's needs, and criteria will be used to rank them for immediate attention. In addition, the manager's expectations will be managed and supported using a personalized service based on confidentiality, loyalty, and mutual respect. 2. Acting as the manager's memory. Functioning as the manager's memory, I will work to eliminate negligence or forgetfulness by keeping meticulous records using tools such as a diary and reminders. The focus will be to make all necessary information readily available within reasonable limits. 3. Disburdening the manager's workload. As a management assistant, I will work to disburden the manager's workload by managing information efficiently, keeping records, and organizing tasks. Computer software will be utilized to automate tasks and information accessibility to facilitate the timely completion of tasks and ensure deadlines are followed. 4. Protection of the manager's office and time. All communication to the manager's office will be screened and visitors will report to the management assistant's desk before entering the manager's office. This will protect the manager's time and help to keep a focused work environment. 5. Daily planning sessions with the manager. Daily planning sessions will be conducted with the manager to establish a well-organized layout for the day. For example priorities, tasks, and any pending items that need attention will be discussed and aligned with the manager's expectations and the day's objectives. Question. Pressure and deadlines are part of a management assistant's job. State things that a secretary should do to avoid feeling overwhelmed by the workload and consequently experiencing too much stress. Five strategies for managing workload stress as a management assistant. One, plan in advance. As a management assistant, it's important to plan tasks and responsibilities proactively. Creating a comprehensive schedule or to-do list helps to organize work efficiently, allowing for a clear understanding of upcoming deadlines and commitments. 2. Delegate. Delegating tasks effectively ensures a more equitable workload distribution, thereby reducing the burden on any single individual and fostering a collaborative work environment. 3. Avoid procrastination. Avoid procrastination, instead, promptly and efficiently tackle tasks to prevent a buildup of work and reduce the stress associated with deadlines. For example, a management assistant can make the workload more manageable by breaking down larger tasks into smaller, more digestible steps. 4. Determine priorities. Identify and prioritize tasks based on urgency and importance. By focusing on high-priority items first, a management assistant can address critical issues and deadlines promptly, preventing a sense of being overwhelmed by an extensive to-do list. 5. Utilize time effectively. Make optimal use of time by adopting time management techniques, such as setting realistic deadlines for tasks, allocating dedicated time slots for specific activities, and minimizing distractions. This will enhance your overall productivity and bring a measure of control over the workload. To access more learning and exam preparation materials, go to www.acemyexams.coza. This link is also in the video description below. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to subscribe and be the first to know when we upload new videos.